good morning, and welcome to LLT 121, Classical Mythology, in which we take up again the career of Heracles, that was his Greek name, it is his Greek name. The Romans called him Hercules, the Panhellenic hero. He's called the Panhellenic hero not because he hit every single frat and sorority house on Greek row every Friday night, although I myself think the Hercules that I know, the Hercules that I'm familiar with, the Hercules who shows up in my classes, certainly would have hit fraternity row and sorority row every night that they were having a party. Because he's the son of Zeus and Alcmena. He had a tough time winning acceptance. He had to perform all sorts of labors because he killed his first wife and his kids. Um, he loves them and leaves them and stuff like that. And today, we're going to have to make him into a philosophical hero, among other things. But first of all, let's um, resume with the twelfth labor. The twelfth labor was Cerberus, the three-headed hound of hell. What is Cerberus's job in Greek mythology? Okay, very good. Well, that is not a very promising start. It looks like a snake wearing dog ears. <laughs> kind of. Um, while he was down there, he talked to this fellow who um, told him, the guy's name is not important. For what it's worth, it's either Meliager or something else. He tells him, you know, Herc, if you're looking for another wife, once you get back, you know, up to the real world, you ought to check out my sister, Deonera. Did you meet Deonera yet? Okay, very good. You may have seen Deonera on um, Hercules, the new adventures thereof. Okay, it's hot in here. How many of you are studying ancient Greek? What is this world coming to? The name Deonera means, in ancient Greek, man destroyer. Gentlemen, those of you who are still single and eligible and all of that, you ever meet a woman or somebody says, I want to fix you up with this gorgeous woman whose name is Man Destroyer, just say no. Hercules got married to Deonera. They hit it off quite nicely. And as they were going off on their honeymoon, as they were going off on their honeymoon, they came to a river. Now, have I told you about centaurs? A centaur is the ancient Greek equivalent of a biker. Okay? Strictly speaking, it is a creature that has the lower extremities of a horse. Okay? And the upper torso. Now, watch. <laughs> of a human being. Okay. Okay, they are very much the ancient equivalent of bikers. These are people who get around, they party real hardy, and like bikers, you do not mess with them. Okay? That is what a centaur is. Actually, a centaur is a survival, if you will, of almost the very beginning of recorded time, a point in time so far back at which people originally learned to ride horses. Think about this. Here we all are, you know, pounding corn to bits with rocks and, you know, wondering where the baby came from and stuff like that. Because there was a time in human existence when humans did that, and all of a sudden people come riding up on horses. You haven't even managed to tame the horse. The horse 
Your civilization hasn't even managed to make the horse stand still long enough for you to try to hop on. And here these people are riding horses. Hey, Randy. Um, you start telling stories about them. They were combinations of people and horses. And pretty soon the stories get so good that you've got the original, the prototype, the archetype, if you will, of the biker. Well, at any rate, here the, this particular centaur's name is Nessus. And Hercules is standing at the riverbank with Deonera, and the centaur says, hey, cent hey, Herc, I'll carry your wife across for you. Gentlemen, think about this. Let's say that you have just gotten married, oh, let's say to Winona Ryder or Alicia Silverstone or whatever, whatever her name is. And you're off on your honeymoon, and you run up to a river, and a biker offers you, say, hey, I could take your wife across the river. What do you do? <laughs> you run. <laughs> you run away in the other direction. And it's not as if Hercules isn't strong enough to carry her. It isn't as, well, at any rate, he says, okay, go ahead, you cut her. <laughs> okay? And so the centaur Nessus takes the new Mrs. Dine, uh, Mrs. Hercules, carries her halfway across the river, and then starts to paw at her and stuff like that. Hercules catches a clue, draws his bow and arrow, and thwap, shoots Nessus, puts five right in the tin ring. You know. And Nessus is dying, but with his last dying breath, he says, that Hercules... You know, he's kind of got a reputation for loving him and leaving him. He's going to lo love you and leave you too. And when he does, take a little bit of the blood that I'm <laughs> dripping out, put it in a little vial, and take it out and rub it on his clothes. It'll heat up your love life. And she does, because she doesn't know any better. She puts some of the blood in there, you know, in a little bottle and saves it. Now this is a bad career move because as you all know, Heracles dipped his arrows in the blood of the dead Hydra in order to make them poisonous. And if you got shot with one of these arrows, your blood is going to be poisonous. But she didn't know that. No, I don't know how she got across the river either. And I don't care. Could be. Why didn't she swim in the first place, Mark? It felt really good to be able to ask you that question. I like that. <laughs> okay, from now on in this class, all smart bleeped questions will be directed to Mark for his inability to answer them. Um, they go on, they get married for a while, they get married, they stay married for a while, they have a couple kids, you know the drill. One day Heracles wakes up and he's married and he's got a couple kids and he can't, you know, like go off to the far end of the world, meet exciting animals and kill them anymore because his wife is saying, Hercules, mow the lawn, Hercules, you know, wash the Jeep Grand Cherokee, you know, Hercules, you know, Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman is on. It's time to watch Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. And he's Hercules, darn it. <clears throat> Setting up the following story. Hercules goes off on just one. Hey, honey, please, please, just one little labor. I need to go off on one adventure. Okay, fine. He goes off on one adventure. There's going to be an archery competition at the city of Trachis. I'm not going to require that you know Trachis. I don't care about it myself. The king, however, um... Of Trachis is having an archery competition. He's got this lovely daughter named Ioli, and whoever wins the archery competition can have Ioli as either wife or concubine. If you're not married, marry her. If you are married, hey, she'll be your mistress. What a great guy, huh? Well, being Hercules, you know who the who's going to win the archery competition, don't you, Carrie? Who wins? Hercules wins. Very good. Were you betting on him? Okay, but then the guy says, uh, 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 no, not happening, Hercules. I'm not going, we've seen this theme already, haven't we? 
when King Augeas had the Augean stables cleaned out, he stiffed Heracles on the contract cleaner's fee. Hercules kills Iole's brother for some reason. By now, you should know that Iole's brother did probably nothing wrong. He was also probably just this meaningless character was just created for one purpose in this story, to get killed. Why did Hercules have to kill Iole's brother? Anybody? Because he slighted Iole by her, or, no, actually, the... You making this up, Mitch? No, that, don't apologize. Don't, here it is. It's rainy. It's cold. It's Monday. And somebody actually read classical mythology over the weekend. You have nothing to apologize for, Mitch. No, the reason is very simple. Hercules has to incur miasma again. Miasma. Your average ancient Greek hero wouldn't leave home without it. Miasma. Your average, everyday, ancient Greek hero wouldn't leave home without it. Yeah, it is a form of eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth justice. Yes, with the invention of the legal, tri I mean, with the invention of purification, you can go off and get purified for it, or you can get into a feud for it, or what have you. But in heroic legend, miasma is more than anything else a plot device to get our hero out of town where he can go off to a far off land, meet interesting people, and kill them again. That, Mitch, is the right answer. <clears throat> Only this one's very silly. To atone for the miasma incurred by the death of Iole's brother, Hercules has to put himself up for auction. We have on this campus, you know, a very cute custom called a slave auction. You ever hear of that? where, you know, it's usually um, women, college women who are bidding on studly college guys and stuff like that, or a bachelor bid thing, whatever. All these various people have to sit around and bid on Heracles' services for a year. The winner, the highest bid belongs to the luscious buxom, hot, sexy queen by the name of Omphale. Omphale is also the ancient Greek word for belly button. Ponder upon the Freudian significance of that, kids. And did I tell you she's hot, lusty, zesty, you know, always wearing low-cut, tight clothes and stuff like that? What do you think, what kind of plans do you think she's got for old Hercules, hmm? But here's the funny thing. He dre she dresses Heracles up in maid clothing and makes him clean house for a year. That's it. You can see Hercules in his little French maid outfit, you know, dusting things and stuff like that. He has to do that for a whole year. Hercules thinks it's pretty funny. <laughs> and I do too. That helps sum up what Heracles is all about. You know, when he is not serving as, you know, an action hero, when he is not, you know, serving as a bridge between the human and the divine, when he is not being the blue collar son of Zeus hero, he looks mighty good in drag. <laughs> and he doesn't mind camping it up a little bit. Uh, never mind. We go on. Oh, wait a second, wait a second. There was an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, was there not, in which Arnold Schwarzenegger got pregnant and gave birth to somebody, right? Possibly a baby. It's nothing new. Hercules used to do drag little, little drag bits every once in a while himself. Okay, finally, he does his year with Queen Omphale. He's very pleased to get done with it. He decides that he wants Ioli. He decides to besiege the city of Trachis. He and his army are storming the walls of Trachis. And it's cold. It's winter time. 
Deanera back tending the home fires, hears that Hercules is off besieging some woman. She feels, well, you know, where, did, where is our love gone? Don't you want me, baby? She um, decides to send up his favorite cloak. But before she sends the favorite cloak of Hercules to keep him warm, she decides to restore the fire to their love life by rubbing the blood of the deceased, or pouring the deceased blood of Centaur Nessus, uh, I caught myself, onto the cloak. Then she bundles it up and sends it to him. The scene switches to Trachis, where Hercules opens it up. Oh, it's from Deianira. Does he feel a second's remorse, Elizabeth? No. Why? Because he's Hercules, darn it. And he opens it up, and it's a cloak. I thought this might keep you warm, beloved husband. Love, man destroyer. <laughs> uh. And he puts it on. And Lord Almighty, he feels his temperature rising. Higher. I mean, he's burning. He's dying. Only he's half immortal, so he can't die. He's really in a sad predicament. Here's what he does. He says, build a funeral pyre for me. Okay, they do that. Put me, the soon-to-be dead Hercules, on top. Okay, they do that. Now, would one of you guys be so good as to light it? Scott, would you light the funeral pyre of Hercules? Please? You would, huh? Why shouldn't he? Because he's still alive, yes. Develop that profound thought a little farther. What happens, Scott, if he says, I changed my mind? <laughs> You're no fun. I asked the wrong guy. I wouldn't do it. I'd say, no, Scott will do it. <laughs> Well, in return for setting a fire, this guy by the name of Poyas, and he's a present from me to you today, Poyas does light the fire. And the smoke wifts up to heaven. The mortal part of Heracles dies and goes to the underworld. The immortal part of Hercules is brought up to Mount Olympus where he becomes a god. He even gets to marry Hebe, the goddess of youth, who is the daughter of Zeus, well, hell, who isn't, uh, uh, and Hera. That is to say that once he's been burned on the funeral pyre, his immortal part goes up to Mount Olympus. No, I don't have any technical details, but he is at long last accepted by Hera because he has suffered enough. And therefore, he is married off to Hebe, the goddess of youth. Not a bad gig. All of the goddesses are gorgeous, but this is the goddess who's in charge of youthful beauty. It is not a bad gig. I pause for your questions. Um, it's Odysseus meets it in book nine of the, I, <laughs> I got an answer for this one. He meets it in the Odyssey. Odysseus is down there and the, the soul's wandering around and it's griping <laughs> and saying, oh, great, you know, the other half. It's like, you know, your older brother who mom and dad always like more than you is up there on Mount Olympus and I'm just stuck down here. Odysseus just goes, oh, no making this guy happy. It just goes on. Ha! Huh. Phil. Has anything happened to Poe? Do we have anything on him after life before? No, but his son, Philoctetes. Well, Poyas gets the bow of Hercules as his reward. And he Poyas passes it on to his son Philoctetes. Philoctetes that's quite a story that we'll get into later on. 
is going to use this bow to bring an end to the Trojan War. It's going to turn out that the Trojan War can only be ended by the use of the bow of Heracles. Other questions? That was pretty sharp, Phil. Other questions? Yeah, I guess she kills herself for shame or something. Apparently, that whining, sniveling turd, King Eurystheus, took this opportunity to persecute Heracles' mother and children and stuff like that. But finally, he gets killed. There's more to the story than that. You can read it in your book. But I'll confess to you folks at this point, it doesn't interest me horribly. What does interest me is that as early as the 5th century BC, one of the neat things about Heracles is that he can symbolize so many different things to so many different people. It is a popular thing, for example, for political candidate, candidates who are behind in a race to claim they are the next Harry Truman. In 1948, Harry Truman was down in the polls until election day. Several newspapers published headlines saying, basically, Harry Truman bites it. Tom Dewey is our next president. Imagine the egg on their face when it turned out the next morning that Harry Truman had won. It's amusing because it doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat like Harry Truman or a Republican. You can still say, I'm the next Harry Truman. George Bush said he was the next Harry Truman. Bob Dole says he's the next Harry Truman. But it, it you know, it, it's the same thing. You can stand for, Harry Truman can stand for whatever you want him to stand for. He doesn't care because he's dead. Hercules can't stand before that human being with the odds against him who strives with might and main against the cruel fate the gods throw at him and somehow triumphs over it. He can stand for that if that's what you need. He can also be a swashbuckling adventure hero who just kills people and things and sleeps with all the women if you need him to be that. Or he can be this beefy, burly, studly kind of guy. He just walks through the jungle flexing if you need that. If you're kind of mad at the gods and goddesses, Hercules shot Hera in the left breast with a three-barbed arrow. Yes. He's polyvalent. He's got all of these different values and meanings to different societies, and when the philosophers get a hold of him, it's even worse. I myself would have a little bit of a problem recommending as a role model somebody who killed his wife and two children. But in the following story, which can be dated back as early as the 5th century BC ancient Greek philosopher Prodicus, Hercules is wandering down the road of life. Did you know that life is a road? Like a, like a road, sometimes life is hard or soft. Sometimes there are hills and valleys and unexpected twists and turns. <coughs> Pardon? Sometimes there's road construction and sometimes there's road kill. Sometimes you don't even know where you're headed, but you keep proceeding anyway in the blind hope that your destination is somewhere good. So on and so forth. This metaphor has been beat. Was, I mean, it had the tar beaten out of it 4,000 years ago, to be honest. And sometimes there are two paths you can go by. <laughs> you know that one too, right? I mean, that's the road of life. But in the long run, there's still time to change the road you're on. If you ever listen to the song Stairway to Heaven by Dead Zeppelin, I mean, you're getting the life as a road metaphor, even while you're going, whoa, cool. Um, Heracles is presented with the same predicament. He says there are two paths he can go by, and there is no long run. There's no time to change the road he's on. One road is virtue, and one road is vice. Each has its own guardian, each road. Virtue is guarded by the ever lovely Roseanne Barr, whereas vice 
is guarded by Winona Ryder. Each says, follow my path and I will personally reward you. Now, the Hercules that you guys have been meeting for the last three class periods, obviously, that's a no-brainer. See ya, Winona. <laughs> and so forth and so on. But Heracles chooses virtue. Heracles chooses the rough path. And you can almost see that. He's the blue-collar hero who nobody ever gave anything to, who has to struggle long and hard to attain godhood. That's what the philosophers did to him. He turns out to be, oddly enough, a darn role model. I pause for your questions at this point. Yes, I thought that was brilliant, too. Our next hero is sort of like the Walmart version of Hercules. He is not to diss Walmart. Maybe he's a Sam's Club. Maybe he's a, the dollar store version of um, Heracles. He's the hero of Athens and Attica. I speak, of course, about Theseus. Attica is right here on your map of ancient Greece. Athens is right here. It is the city-state well, the city-state of Athens did have a substantial amount of physical, political power at several times during the classical Greek period. It so happens that about 80 to 85 percent of classical, quote-unquote, ancient Greek literature was either written at Athens or by somebody who was visiting Athens or by somebody who was from Athens but got kicked out or left for some reason, you'd begin to thinking that Athens gets a lot of good press, right? Does that make sense? In ancient Greek literature, because that's where a lot of the literature is coming from. Interestingly, I think we've done this little trick at before, Boeotia, with the main city of Thebes, is the city that gets a bum rap in all of Greek mythology for the main and simple reason that it's located next to Athens. Imagine, if you will, a history of Arkansas written strictly by people from Missouri or vice versa. And you have an idea of how the people of Athens just slag on the Boeotians. That's neither here nor there. What is here or there is that the Athenian hero Theseus could not begin to me measure up to Hercules. <clears throat> you could say with strict confidence and with, you know, utter plausibility, I knew Heracles. Heracles and I spent a week together in classical mythology, and you, sir, are no Heracles. However, Theseus is <clears throat> the hero of Athens, so he gets included in all sorts of stories. He gets made to look good in all sorts of stories, except for Euripides' Hippolytus. He looks like, kind of like a jerk there, but that's okay. So much so to the point where the Athenians had a saying, not without Theseus, which basically means I'm in chapter four of my new exciting adventure novel. I haven't mentioned Theseus yet, haven't pumped up the homeboy yet. So Theseus makes an appearance. Even the Athenians joked about Theseus's way of showing up in just about everything an Athenian ever wrote. Let's go back though to the foundation of the city of Athens. Let's have a couple really gross, disgustipating kind of stories. In ancient Greece, it was considered very prestigious, as it is here today in the United States and in many other countries around the world, to have been, to say, my ancestors go back, blah, 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 blah. My ancestors go back all the way to the Mayflower. Actually, they didn't. 
But if you can make that claim, you know, in certain circles, you're considered better than other people. I am reasonably sure that all of my ancestors came over here in the late 1850s from various places around Europe because they were either poor or being run out by the government or both. As were many of yours. The indigenous people here, the Native Americans, the so-called Indians, have been here for centuries, and so on. But for what it's worth, the ancient Greeks liked to be able to say, my family, the Hughes family, has been here in Springfield since the first house was built in Springfield. Sometimes these stories got a little ridiculous. Sometimes people, families, claim that their ancestor popped right out of the ground. It doesn't get worse than that. Well, here's what happens. The first king of Athens was supposedly a guy by the name of Erichthonius. We can call him Eric. Supposedly, when Athena was born, how was Athena born? She popped out of Zeus's head. Who was the midwife? Hephaestus, very good. How did he serve as the midwife? Yeah, wrapped him upside, the, not upside, on top of the head with a great big axe, right? And, Ath <laughs> and Athena pops out dressed in her full armor and stuff, right? And says, ooh, ooh, ooh. According to this legend, Hephaestus's, Hephaestus's midwife fee, this is Grody, was, shall we say, first crack, if you will, at his newborn infant sister. This is how the story goes. On the other hand, Athena was destined to be a virgin and always was a virgin. As the story goes, Hephaestus was running after Athena to claim his prize. But remember, he is handicapped, he is club-footed, so he does not get around very well. And shall we say, he casts his seed upon the ground. He onanizes, he commits self-abuse, he, if you know what I mean, and from that incredibly fertile patch of ground pops up this creature with the body of a snake and the head of a human. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the first king of Athens, Erichthonius. <laughs> the sort of hero we can all be really proud of, right? <clears throat> but for what it's worth, you can just see how this myth, this legend, if you will, came about. There was a family, the royal family, probably of Athens, at some point le lost in the dark of history, wanted to justify their claim to kingship by saying our family has been around here literally as long as the dirt, okay? Our family is so old, we have been the kings of this joint since Athena was a little baby. And then some wise guy, it's usually Mark, says, well, how did you guys get here? And the usual answer is, we popped out of the ground. The Greek term for this is autochthony. A-U-T-O-C-H-T-H-O-N-Y. We're going to see it again. It's, very com it's a great conversation stopper in most instances. We've been around so long, our family, our ancestor, Eric, popped out of the ground. And then some wise character, most likely Mark, says, well, 
How did he just pop out of the ground? Why don't I see all sorts of people just popping out of the ground now? And I say, it was very special ground. It was very fertile ground. Then somebody with a warped, perverted mind asks me, well, how did it get special? You can see where we get this story. Why not? A snake is symbolic of many things, but it, I mean, it, creative power, for example. It can be a great big, huge, long, slithering phallic symbol if you want to interpret it that way. Um, it hatches out of an egg. A snake can devour its own tail, supposedly, sometimes. I mean, what happens when the snake eats its own tail? No, no, it, 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 he would be the first to tell you, say it now, say it loud, I'm half snake, but I'm all proud. Well, I'm, we don't really have time to get into the importance of Theseus, but let me tell you a couple of little stories, okay? A couple of little storyettes about the Royal House of Athens. I can't wait to look at the syllabus and find out how far behind we are, but as long as we have fun getting there, that's cool. Story number one is the story of Cephalus and Procris. <laughs> Cephalus's name in ancient Greek means head. Cephalus, or head, had assisted Herc's dad Amphitryon in one or another of his labors. It so happens that he decided he was going to find out whether his wife was faithful to him. He had this habit of dressing up in disguise and trying to pick up his own wife. This is weird. You know, he puts on his sharp looking clothes and his chest hair wax and puts on, you know, a necklace with the name like Bob or, you know, not Cephalus because then she'd know, and trying to hit on her. Finally, he hits on her, he hits on her, he hits, he's just a pain, and finally she says, okay, we can get it on, you know, we can do whatever, but just stop bloody hounding me, huh? And then, of course, he rips aside his disguise. To, it is I, your husband, Cephalus, and you are just a worthless two-bit tramp. What a jerk. I mean, this, this is talk show fodder. I can just imagine, you know, like Jenny Jones or Heraldus soaking their fangs into this. Well, Procne, quite, I, I'm sorry, Procris, because that's her name, um, not unreasonably decides, I've had it with being a married woman. I'm going to go traipse around in the woods with the priestesses of Artemis, a womanly bunch of women who go off and do whatever they want without any men around to, you know, make them feel guilty or inferior or anything. Procris becomes such a favorite with Artemis that Artemis gives Procris a dog who will always catch what he chases, and a spear which will always hit what you throw it at. And then, for some reason I can't explain, she decides, Procris decides, I'm going to go back to Cephalus, my husband, the head. Well, the dog doesn't stick around for very long. The dog chases a fox who is destined never to be caught. Ovid tells a story, it's really hilarious. The dog and the fox chase each other until they get turned into a rock or something else. Cephalus, Cephalus gets Procris to lend him the spear. Honey, give me the spear, I want to go out hunting. Oh, cool. It's anything I want. You know, so like, enough of your stupid questions, Mark. Or I can go like that. <laughs> or I can hunt like, oh, look. You know, it's really hilarious. It's great. You can't miss. Watch this. 
after you know a few hours of you know you know and shooting everything in the damn for darn forest he gets tired and he lays down in the shade of a tree and this story is told to us by Ovid and it only works in Latin he's lying under the tree and he's saying to the breeze come breeze and cool me the Latin word for breeze is aura okay, it ends in the name a which is a very common well I mean in Latin that's what women's names end in is a and he says because Ovid's telling us this story in Latin come aura spread yourself all over me like a cheap suit come aura baby you know and so on and so forth I mean it's really sensual well, have to over me, baby. Um, um, but Tiny does he realize that Procris is hiding in the bushes because she's become jealous of him. And she's going, who is this Laura that he's yelling for? I'm going to, oh, I can't take it anymore. And she rustles the bushes. There's just a little rustle from the bushes, and lying flat on his back, over his shoulder, he hears it, Cephalus, the head, hears it, you know, tosses the, the spear up, and drills Procri right in the heart. Procris, or whatever her name is, right in the heart. And as she's dying, goes, Please don't leave me for that tramp, Laura. <coughs> the end. You've been a very good class. I'll see you tomorrow. Or whenever I'll see you. Now that you've had an opportunity to examine the myths and legends concerning the Greek hero Heracles, otherwise known as Hercules, um, you've had the opportunity to see him in his 12 labors, you've had the opportunity to see him as a role model for aspiring Roman Stoic philosophers, you've had the opportunity to meet um, Roman emperors who believe that they were in fact Heracles. We've seen a number of different, we've seen the action hero Heracles, we've seen the ladies man Heracles. You're probably in a little bit better position to understand why it is that there has really never been any satisfactory Heracles novel. No entirely satisfactory Heracles movie. I would venture to say that um, making this sort of a movie would be impossible. That Heracles, in his various incarnations, over the 3,000 years that his stories have been told, 4,000 years more closely, has taken on so many different roles, so many different um, attitudes, been involved in so many different things, come into contact with so many peculiar Weltanschauungen, that's the plural of Weltanschauung, that it would be impossible to freeze him in any one particular piece of time. I'm aware of a number of old movies in which the famous actor Steve Reeves um, unleashes his thespian talents to enact the glory of Hercules. Steve Reeves, I believe, was a big muscular fellow who traipses about in a loincloth strangling things. That's great. That's the sort of Heracles that the Greeks liked to hear about back in Homer's day. Then the immortal Lou Ferrigno, he of the immortal Hulk fame, um, also gave the the <clears throat> myth of Heracles a shot um, and although I myself have not been blessed with the opportunity to see it, Matt tells me that it's really pretty bad. But there again, 
Nobody ever expected fine acting, riveting character delineation, and sensitive plot from Heracles. A recent movie by a very large film entertainment concern um, presents Heracles as an animated musical adventure hero. And to um, people who know me, know what I do for a living, I'm a professor of classics, they expect me to be horrified by somebody turning Heracles into this animated fellow. You can, you know, seeing Heracles figurines at um, McDonald's or Burger King or go over to the mall and see little Heracles displays. I say great. More than anything else, the philosophical profundities aside, the um, Weltanschauung aside, the cachet, the, the um, aura of the blue-collar hero that Heracles exudes, the dead Roman emperors, Ovid and his metamorphoses aside, Heracles and his legends have survived to this day first and foremost because they were entertaining. Because Heracles was basically, was first and foremost, a sort of hero who went off to far off lands, met interesting monsters, and killed them. To me, putting Heracles in a McDonald's with his little Heracles figurines and the voice of Danny DeVito singing some gorpy song, it doesn't offend me in the least. And I think that if there ever was a real Heracles, if there ever was a basic Heracles who lived and killed monsters and stuff like that, that this Heracles would be unbelievably amused and delighted to know that he had his own animated musical. I've not seen it yet, I imagine I will. You may well have seen it by the time this airs. Enjoy, it's part of the fun of Heracles. Part of the fun of Heracles is seeing what other generations do with him. And that is just, well, <laughs> that is basically what the classics is all about, too. Thank you.